are these people? Colin, we've talked plenty on the show about reparations, as you are one to do. Um, yeah. But we haven't talked about it in relation to Palestine much. I have. You, you I have well, a little I bit. Have. I brought. Well, I brought out the idea that they're owed. Yes. You know, for for that, and you know, in time, if you know, we ever declare what's happening in Palestine a genocide in the future, then this issue is going to come up. And I'm sure, you know, among the black community, especially in this country, they might be pissed because, yep. you know, they've been talking somewhat about reparations forever. And the idea possibly that, you know, um, that they, well, we'll see, but the idea is that Palestinians may have that discussion of reparations and then people might actually do something for them, maybe over black people. Right. And this is why I kind of say for black people who are like, oh, the issue of Palestine doesn't concern me. It will if they talk about reparations. Yeah. Um, so it's in so, your best interest to kind of watch what's at least kind of be aware of what's going on over there uh, yeah. for this reason alone, if you care about it. So this is from Juan Cole over at Informed Comment, and they asked, does Britain owe reparations to the Palestinians for engineering their loss of their country? So, you know, we talked about how Britain's a lot to blame for this problem, you know, between the Balfour Declaration and all that jazz. They, you know, lots of shenanigans right. with this. Um, but he continues, uh, the Nehesi Coates made the argument for U.S. reparations for slavery in 2014 in the Atlantic. In that essay, he made an analogy with German reparations to Israel, which we covered, no? Or that exact thing, I do believe. I don't so, think so. I think we did. Might be also think, worth looking. I, I think it was not in depth, but you might definitely be worth covered looking. this bit for sure. Um, that bit for sure, but not so, his take on it. Yep. In his new book, The Message, Coates expresses regret for the unexamined Zionist bases in that analogy, which obscured the disposition of the Palestinian people and their consignment to form to a form of Jim Crow, something he realized forcefully on a recent trip to Israel and Palestine. Caribbean and African leaders of the British Commonwealth, CNN reports, are, insisting, are insistently raising the issue of British reparations for slavery and for Shanghai and colonial subjects shipping Indians off to Guyana and Fiji on false pretenses. British ships transported some 3 million Africans to the New World between 1640 and 1807, 400,000 of whom died in transit. The unpaid labor of these enslaved people and their descendants added significantly to Britain's bottom line. Jamaica, one of London's most profitable colonies because of the sugarcane trade produced by slave plantations, figures Britain owes it 9.5 trillion dollars right can I, and I will say this again because i know the issue that people have with reparations is that people think oh it's coming from our taxes yeah no it doesn't no it's not coming from you it's coming from these corporations that have gone rich off our yeah. backs that's where it's yeah. coming from so you don't need to worry about my taxes your taxes coming to me well if I were to be here, I wouldn't receive reparations here, um, given that I am not, um, I wasn't, you know, I don't have lineage in America. My lineage is in the Caribbean. So, but it would come from these corporations, not yeah. from the taxpayer. So, once we see that the Palestinians are a deeply injured party, it becomes clear that they are owed reparations. After World War I, the victors divided up the defeated empires at Versailles and the satellite conference of San Remo. The League of Nations awarded the great powers mandates, giving them charge of territories on the grounds that they would administer them and also prepare them for independent statehood. This was a new form of colonialism. Since the freebooters of the 18th century conquered countries like India purely from profit, with no obligation to ready it for independence, it has been up to Winston Churchill, Britain would still be ruling India and taking money out of it to pay for his brandy and cigars. 
As I point out in my new book, Gaza Yet Stands, the British mandate of Palestine was peculiarly compared to all the rest. The British mandate of Iraq, we talked about a minute ago, eventuated in an independent Iraq in 1932. Formerly, German Tanganyika was a British mandate and became independent in 1961. It joined with Zanzibar to become Tanzania in 1964. Syria, a French mandate, became independent in 1946. The French mandate of Togo became independent in 1961. So just getting our timelines in order. The British mandate of Palestine, however, did not eventuate into independent Palestine. The other League of Nation members, including France and Italy, remonstrated with Britain that it had to look after the native Palestinians despite the Balfour Declaration of 1917, in which the British, who did not then rule Palestine, promised a Jewish national home there that they pledged would in no way disturb the locals. Well, turns right. out... Right, and we talked about the Balfour Declaration on the show. The language of it, at least the way I interpreted it, suggested that, well, Israel would be a national home versus the, the. national home. Which right. is different because the denotes it as definitive, like a represents it as a possible possibility. So right. there's a vagueness there that I would argue that I would argue Zionists you have basically hijacked in order to take advantage of the situation of what is now occurring um, in the region right now. So. Yeah. It's the idea, like, it can be, what, to me, it presents the idea of one, one, one of poss other possibilities, not necessarily, like, the place for you to call your safety home, whatever, you know, that's the argument, is that Israelis feel like they need a country to be considered safe, Well, I argue that many of them who live in Europe are probably among the safest. You know, given yeah, sometimes class, but more often than not, race. Um, especially if you're of lighter complexion. Well, Lord Curzon wrote in 1920, as regards the Palestinian mandate, this mandate also has passed through several revises. It was first shown to the French government and at once excited their vehement criticism on the ground of it almost exclusively Zionist complexion and of the manner in which the interests and rights of the Arab majority, amounting to about nine-tenths of the population, were ignored. So this is in 1920 that, like, the French are going, uh, it might not be good. So, which I've not seen a lot of that talked about. You know, we've talked about the Balfour, but I haven't heard a lot of, like, the pushback from it at the time. Right. You know, that's kind of gotten whitewashed out of things. So um the Italian the Italian government expressed similar apprehension. It was felt that this would constitute a very serious and possibly a fatal objection when the mandate came ultimately before the Council of the League. The mandate, therefore, was largely rewritten and finally received their assent. And I'm sure people got paid off too to accept something they didn't want. Um, as they do these days. But the League of Nations therefore demanded that the British mandate of Palatine attend to the interests and rights of the 90% of its residents who were native Palestinian. When Palestinians revolted in 1936 to 1939 against the British policy of settling European Jews on their land, the British army brutally crushed them with the help of Jewish militias like the Haganah Embarrassed, the British commissioned the MacDonald White Paper of 1939, which pledged an independent Palestinian state by 1949, in which immigrant Jews would form a minority. So, you ever hear that? You ever hear the MacDonald White Paper? I haven't, actually. So, they're supposed to have an independent state by 1949. What happened? You know? That, right. That I know so, should be upset. 
when was when was this? They were supposed to have it, 1949. 49. Right? So the British abruptly departed Palestine in 1948, and they failed to prevent the half billion Jews they had brought to Palestine from expelling 750,000 or so of the 1.3 million Palestinians from their home and usurping all their property, leaving them stateless, homeless, and penniless. Some 250,000 of those refugees were crowded into Gaza, where their descendants are now being genocided by the Netanyahu government. The value of the land seized from the Palestinians at the time is estimated at over half a billion dollars in 1998 dollars. What do you think the inflation rate on that is? I have no idea, but like... So, <laughs> but that 500... 500 million worth of property in 1948 is worth way more today. Yeah, like it would be probably in the trillions at this point. Yeah. The total value of Israeli real estate today is roughly 2.5 trillion. And in 1920, when the British accepted the charge of administering the mandate of Palestine and turning it into an independent country for its citizens, the Palestinians owned virtually all of the land in it. So, I mean, what, 90% of 2.5 trillion is... I, I can't do that math. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like... That's too uh, big of a number to do in my head. So, Juan Cole said, says that 2.5 trillion is a good place to start for British reparations to the Palestinian. That is roughly a year's worth of the UK GDP, but I'm sure the Palestinians would accept an installment plan. <laughs> <laughs> so, any thoughts so far? Honestly, I would think that would be a lot higher than that. Sure. Considering that, you know, for now, granted, you can argue like the slave trade in, at least in America, occurred for a longer period of time, and the estimated cost of reparations to African American descendants of slaves, I believe it's around 14 trillion, if I remember the numbers right. Um, and there and like the estimated value is 2.5 for Palestinians, which I guess considering, I guess probably, but the slight difference with this is you know, like well, as Sabi says. The idea of reparations is to, you know, not pay off, but to um, atone for a debt that's owed, you know. And, you know, and, and again, I don't want people to think solely as reparations equals money. It can be, but I think it goes a lot deeper than that. It goes into the terms of, I think, generally healing, which I don't think anyone really talks about, but especially like, and again, I give my this example all the time when I went to Rwanda, you know, they're still celebrating, well, mourning, really, like the genocide of their people now, and it's been over 30 years. Like, they haven't gotten over that. And so... It, it it's a lot more. I think it's very. You know, I think it's very superficial just to think, oh, reparations equals, well, money. It right. can be. I think it's part of it, but more of the idea. And we kind of looked at Caricom's uh, ten point plan. Like it would include. Well, in my mind, it would include. Like systems to kind of help rebuild a country from the devastation that it occurred to where the idea is, you know, especially with those social justice infrastructure things in place, that such an event will never happen again. So in Gaza's case, it's the idea of like, as we've talked about numerous times on the show, the whole entire infrastructure has been leveled. So people are like, oh, Trump is going to level it. It's been leveled already. Yeah. Like, there are no schools. There's no hospitals. 
There's no homes. So, There's someone said the other day, right now, it's been what, leveled already. What What could he do that's worse other than dig up the bodies and bomb them again? Like you can't, you know, it's not possible. Right. So, so, like people are dead already. So, it's the idea of like for the people who survive. How can they rebuild not just the infrastructure, not the physical needs, but also like I'm also just thinking mental health, like how to rewire the brain from the devastation that you're seeing, you know, so that includes healthcare, that includes education, that includes, you know, restoration of families and friends and neighbors and uncle and like like that are gone. Like, literally having to rebuild a people group up. You know, so that takes, so that, so really, it's very complex. And, and I think, uh, and I think the more I think about this, we don't, again, it's so superficial that we talk about reparations in terms of money, because it's just like, all oh, these people are getting a check. And then it's the idea of like, oh, well, you know, like, they get a check and they go on their merry way. Yeah, you can have the money, and we kind of see it, you know, with our po- with politicians or people well, cla- in power. Classically, it was yeah. about land, not money. Which, right? You know, like right. land has been stolen from the Palestinians. Land has been stolen from your people. They were taken from the land that they once were a part of. So, you know, I think that's the key. You know giving them that couple of acres might not be a bad idea as far as that's concerned. Right. To me. Right. You know? but it, it, to me, it doesn't make having all the land that get back to you doesn't make it any better. If your family was killed over yeah. that land, yep. you can get back the land. And I argue, depending on the pollution, and like that could be a whole other sure. issue in of itself. But, but I think relatively, or at least theoretically, you can reverse that damage. You know, you can't bring back people. You can bring back those family members who are gone. So I just think it's a lot more deeper and a lot more complex than I think we're willing to discuss. And so this is why I kind of get upset, you know, like with people just being like, it's about, I think that's just kind of very basic in terms of it's about the money. No, it's not just about the money or the land or whatever else. It's about the people who were lost that people would need, like, you know, again, mental health therapy, you know, like those conversations in order for them to feel not even whole. I'm not sure if you can even feel whole after, like, if you go through something like that, but at least being in a position where you can possibly rebuild and have a people group kind of reborn from that damage. So, so yeah, so I think it's a good start, but I think that's only like the floor in terms of the work that needs to happen. And we, and I think we kind of discussed this a couple of weeks ago uh, when we talked about, um, you know, the two state solution Thing that has been passed on. It's like it's been viewed as a very lazy way of thinking about it when the real solutions are going to be a lot more complex and a lot more comprehensive yeah. than just what the two states or just give some land to Israelis and give some land to Palestinians and go about their merry way and have it be done with. No, there's history there. Like there's tension still there. And like that has to also have to kind of be resolved and kind of work through. And that's going to take decades to even kind of get to a point where, you know, if there were even be a one state solution where people would somewhat, I would argue, at minimum tolerate each other, like Israelis and Palestinians, if it were to be that way. So, um, so all of that, I'm just basically saying there's a lot more that is going into reparations than just the money. Uh, so I kind of wish, I, I honestly wish that there could be more discussions as to, I think, the psychological 
aspect of reparations too and the mental aspect of it too um you know i understand like the financial part because people i think generally have an understanding of that but you know there's the idea of like you know families are gone like people have lost body parts you know like Schools are destroyed. Hospitals destroyed. The land is corrupted and polluted. Like, that's a whole lot of work and a whole lot of money, I think, to even bring that up See, to a level where it could be livable. That's the thing. Yeah. I think I think the money is still there, which I brought, I brought this video that kind of explains why they're even still doing what they're doing, right? And it's it's mainly for resources, as it usually is, you know. But you know, I'll, I'll let this lady explain some of it. Okay. I can't hear it. You can't hear it. How about I do? What I fix that? Mm. Only nine kilometers away from an ongoing genocide for eight months and continuous massacres committed for uh, people who are living in tents were forced to displace their tents. An American ship stealing gas on the beaches of Gaza. And instead, they're preventing the real Palestinian fishermen from entering and bringing food to the people starving here because they are closing the borders. This is how America is rolling the world. Whenever and wherever they find anything that worth a genocide, they commit a genocide without thinking twice. This is why a genocide is now ongoing in Gaza, to steal the lands of Gaza to the Israelis and to steal the gas of Gaza to the Americans. That's it. This is the deal, my dear world and my dear people. And unfortunately, nearly all the people, all the world knows that, but no one is stopping the main reason the colonizers, the American colonizers from stealing the wealth of, of people and of nations. This is the main reason behind every genocide and every colonization in the world until now. Okay, um, another thing you need to know also is that uh, they found a, a, a very large, massive uh, a quantity of gas on the beaches of Gaza on the 2000s. They are, okay, planning for this genocide since the year 2000. But now is the real timing. I mean, uh, they, wanna, they don't want to relay on other gases. I'm talking about the East gas. I'm talking about Russia gas. Now they can steal this gas. Uh, in Arabic, we say, Now go and translate this and you'll know what I mean. Long live, long live our Palestinian fishermen, our Palestinian workers and our Palestinian people who are suffering despite everything and suffering because of the colonizers, because of those who only want money and nothing but money. There, standing there, watching us being killed because of their freaking gas. Closing thoughts. I mean, as I said, I think the whole topic of reparations in general, I think, is a lot more complex than I think what people make it out to be. And and I do think it should be seriously talked about, and definitely for Black people, such as myself, but I think especially for Palestinians. And I hope there will come a point where Palestinian that kind of discussion among Palestinians can be discussed. Uh, but that's why I say again to Black people in particular, that is why you need to be more concerned with what's going on in foreign policy. Because if if in any event Palestinians are going to get reparations or the idea of reparations before you, you're going to feel slighted for sure. So in my mind, it's in your best interest to kind of at least see where this is going. And then, you know, and I just kind of say, especially in terms of reparations, yes, I understand that Black people in the West have different cultural 
things that make our kind of reparations, depending on what region you're from, maybe slightly different, but still from the same cause. So I would think it would make sense to you all to kind of unite in terms of what those commonalities are. That's what we call solidarity in order to fight for those things on a larger scale. And even in the article, it mentioned that, and I've, we've kind of talked about on the show that, you know, Caribbean and uh, Black Europeans have been leading the charge of talking about reparations and have spoken to politicians in the higher places of government about it, or at least call them out about it. You don't hear that kind of discussion necessarily in Congress here. Now, granted, it's just talk, but, you know, but at least in the Caribbean and in Europe, like the discussion I think has been had at least of people in higher levels of government. Um, that issue is not necessarily being touched here. You know, like Kamala mentioned, oh, we just need a study. Girl, the studies have been done. So it's whether or not you have the balls to actually follow that through. And I know some of you, even in our chat, are not necessarily going to agree with me on the idea of reparations. But again, if you believe in social justice, which I know many of you do, then you should acknowledge the fact that Black people in this country, I will say, have been wronged and that a debt is owed to them, you know, given the history that we've gone through. Um, but as I said, it's a lot more complex than just money and land that mm -hmm. there's, I think, I believe that there is um, a mental psychological component of reparations too that also should be discussed. And I think, you know, and I think especially moving forward, we should be having those discussions more openly. No, I agree. Um, you know, so, but talking about these things, that's why we're demonetized. You can go to codashb.com slash Indie News Network or scan that QR code on your screen. And remember, Ina News is brought to you by viewers like you. Um, you know, if you can't do that, we get it. It's hard out here. You know, just like and subscribe. Do all the engagement stuff that's supposed to help. Make sure to share this with your friends if you feel like it'll help them. But, you know, leave a comment. We read those. Otherwise, thanks for watching.